It's beautiful to see so many of you on here today. And this is the first of my daily series for the week. Um, so many of you are stuck at home because of lockdowns. I think billions of people around the world are largely stuck at home. And so I want to be of service. And so I'm doing a live video every day this week at 11 11 New York City time. That's 8 11 a.m. in California. And that's 5 11 over here in France. I chose 11 11 just because I like the time. I don't have any crazy significance to it. I just thought it would be nice for the people that I've seen asking that. And this series is here to be of service. I am here to share stories, to share inspiration, and my tips and my advice on how to live a more sustainable, happy, and healthy life. So please do ask questions in the comment section and I will ask answer some of them. Today's topic is something that is absolutely one of the most frequently asked questions and that is how did I awaken? You know, what was my what was my awakening? A lot of people, when they see my life, I've shared a lot. I've shared many times that I wasn't always this way, that I didn't always care about environmental issues and wasn't wasn't always living in a manner where my actions were in alignment with my beliefs. You know, the, I was living the American dream for a long time. And so a lot of people, they just they just see there must have been some sort of moment of enlightenment, you know, some sort of awakening to get to where I am today. And so that's one of the most frequently asked questions. And that's what we're going to be covering. And tomorrow, we're going to take it to the next step. And tomorrow, I'm going to share over 100 positive changes that I made and that you can make as well. So here we are. It's wonderful to be here with you, all of you. And I'm going to start on my story of awakening. So before I can really go into the actual awakening itself, I have to go to the time before that, when I was asleep, when I was dreaming. And so for much of my early teens into my early 20s, my goal was to live the American dream. I actually grew up very low income in a small town in northern Wisconsin. And it was my mom and us four kids in a two-bedroom duplex. And we were very low income. My mom made about $15,000 a year or something around there to support four kids. Now, we did get government help. We got food stamps and rent assistance and electricity assistance. And so we had our basic needs met and we, you know, we lived a, a, a fairly comfortable life. But I always felt extremely poor. And so for so much of my childhood, I felt different from everyone else. My dad was not around. Um, there were three dads for us four children and none of them were really around. So it was mostly just my mom and us kids. And then we had help from my aunt and my grandpa. So being poor and then not having a dad both set me made me feel very different from other people. And then another big thing was that I am Jewish. Now, we weren't really practicing Jewish family, but born Jewish. My mom's Jewish. Every you know, Everyone in her family before her is Jewish. Um, we are from what would be present day Ukraine. And so where I grew up, there were only three Jewish families in a town of about 8,620 people. So in that way, I was also feeling very different from other people. And where I grew up being Jewish, um, well, I didn't think of it as a good thing. Mostly I only heard you know, negative words associated with being Jewish. I watched South Park, for example, and it was always negative, uh, negative connotations with Jewish people. And I actually grew up thinking that Jew, short for Jewish, was a bad word. I actually thought that Jew was, you know, basically a swear word. And so that was another thing that I was basically hiding. And so being, you know, being pretty poor, not having a dad around, our house from the outside, the, 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 the chips of 
paint, the paint was flaking off in chips. And I just, I just wanted to be like everybody else. I wanted to have money and I wanted to be normal. And so for so much of my childhood, that was my, that was my goal. I bought clothes to fit in. I designed my life to largely fit in. And so that kind of shaped some of my early adulthood. What I decided is that I wanted to basically pursue the American dream. I wanted to have a nuclear family, you know, a mom and a dad and kids. I wanted to do that. I wanted to have a nice car and a nice house. I wanted to have a job. And I wanted to pursue what I saw through media and through looking at some of my friends' family as the American dream, something that's a picture that's painted through a lot of movies, a lot of mainstream media, and through society. And so that became largely my focus for quite some time. I decided that I wanted to become a millionaire by the time I was 30. That was a focus, a goal of mine that I made probably in my early 20s. And I became very focused on material possessions and financial wealth. And that was where I was going for a while. I went to school for uh, biology at University of Wisconsin La Crosse. And during that time, I always had some environmental mindset. Um, at, the, at the parties that we had, I was the one who would recycle the beer cans and the beer bottles afterwards and not throw them in the garbage. I would always, you know, make sure to use water somewhat wisely. Like when my roommate Ricky had the, the faucet on, I remember yelling at him and telling him, you know, Ricky, shut off the faucet and we'd get in fights. And I put in energy efficient light bulbs into the house and every year I would take them and put them into the new house to save electricity. So I always was actually living somewhat of an environmentally friendly life. There was always some of that within me. So I'm actually have, I'm watching some of the comments over here so I get a little bit distracted but I'm going to I'm going to take questions afterwards uh, after I share the story and then I'll take questions. Okay, so what happened then, I was pursuing this, 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 basically this American dream. And what happened was after university, I graduated in 2009 and it was 2011. So I was 25 years old and something happened and I realized that I had to drastically and radically transform my life. And this is the point, this is the part of the story where a lot of people expect, you know, some sort of big moment of enlightenment or, a, you know, a huge aha moment or maybe a near death or something that would create radical, you know, create that radical change of thought. But for me, there was nothing like that. What happened is I started to educate myself. I started to watch a lot of documentaries and read a lot of books, and I just started to learn that my life wasn't what I thought it was. I started to realize that my life had been sold to me by mainstream media, by society, and by corporations and government. And I realized that what I thought my life was, it just wasn't. Now, at the same time, I had just moved out of Wisconsin to San Diego, California. And so I also was surrounded by a new group of people. I had moved away from Wisconsin where, where, where I grew up and where I went to school at University of Wisconsin La Crosse. I felt very much like you're kind of caged in by some societal norms. So I remember, for example, in Wisconsin, if you were vegetarian, it was like at every meal, you could have people harassing you, like, where's the beef at every single meal? And just that little bit of being different, and this is something people experience all over the United States and the world, but there, it was strong enough where I feel like it, it makes it very hard for people to change. So at the time that I was awakening, I was in San Diego, and I was in a place where not necessarily everybody was thinking the same, no, but where people were just okay with you thinking whatever you wanted to think. I was around more open-minded people, and this allowed me to explore 
more easily and just explore being myself and embracing who I was. So I was educating myself. I was watching a lot of documentaries and I was reading a lot of books. And I started to realize that almost every single action that I was taking had would caused destruction to the earth and had been monetized by a corporation. So the food that I was eating was coming from factory farms where animals were being treated horribly. It was being shipped around the world, guzzling fossil fuels and being sprayed with pesticides. And the food that I was eating was leaving behind huge amounts of trash for future generation generations. The car I was driving, well, that gas that I was pumping into it, that was a part of the routine 10,000 oil spills that happen per year. And it was a part of war where we, you know, a lot of American wars were being fought for oil. So I realized when I was pumping that gas into my car, I was a part of war and I was a part of these oil spills. And I realized the trash that I was creating from so many different ways was filling up landfills and some of it making it to the lakes, the oceans, the rivers and forests and, and littering the world that I loved. The cheap junk I was buying at the time, I bought most of my stuff from Walmart or a lot of my stuff from Walmart. And I realized that people on the other side of the world were working in horrible conditions to bring me this cheap junk. And that people's environments and other species environments were being polluted for me to have this cheap junk. And even the water that I was drinking in San Diego at the time, I learned that it was pumped across, it was put through canals across the desert, hundreds of miles, and half of it would soak into the ground and evaporate before even getting to me. So I learned that the Colorado River was run, running dry and no longer making it to the Sea of Cortez to bring that water to me. And so what happened was I learned that almost every single thing that I was doing was causing destruction to people, to other species, and to the world that I loved. And the thing was, I just didn't know that. Before that, I hadn't realized that my actions were causing all of this destruction. I was disconnected from it. At the same time, I realized that my life had been monetized by corporations, that so many of the things that I was doing, I was really just doing because corporations had sold me on this idea that I needed it. So for, ex for example, body odor. At the time, I used Old Spice deodorant. And I thought that in order to be you know, an acceptable human being in society, a contributing member of society that I needed to wear deodorant. But I started to think about it and I realized human beings have existed long before deodorant ever existed. But there's this idea that everybody needs it. In order to fit in, you need it. And this idea that it's bad to simply be a human being. And these corporations were making billions of dollars off of making us feel uncomfortable with ourselves. And I decided I just wanted to be able to comfortably be myself without needing approval and without corporation, without having to buy things from corporations. I also realized that, you know, money in itself was causing so much destruction and that our financial system was so broken and cut and had so much corruption in it. I learned that my bank, that my money in the bank account, I had Chase, uh, Chase Bank at the time was being used to invest in destructive practices. And the money that I had invested in mutual funds was invested in cigarettes and fossil fuels and other industries. So I learned that I was just deeply, deeply wrapped into all of this stuff that I didn't support and that there was so much corruption in the government that I was unearthing through learning. 
at the same time, I was also surrounded by new people, as I mentioned, and I was surrounded, uh, some of my best friends in San Diego that I met uh, went to a school called Pacific College of Oriental, of Oriental Medicine, and they were studying Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, acupuncture, massage, and herbalism. And so that was another part of just rethinking my body. And so I decided that I wanted to break free from the corruption. I wanted to break free from all the injustice, all of the lies, all of the inequality. I realized that the way that I was living my life, just simply to meet my needs, it required me to be pillaging resources and quality of life from other people. And I just decided that wasn't right. That wasn't the way that I was going to live anymore. And so I realized that I had to, to totally radically transform my life. I was 25 years old at the time, and I realized that I was a living hypocrisy. I learned that my actions were not in alignment with my beliefs at all. And a lot of people at that point would feel total doom and gloom, totally hopeless and helpless, and just think, what can I possibly do? I'm, I'm one in seven billion people and I've been living this way for two and a half decades already. Can I really change my life? I mean, I'm surrounded by this normal way of being. So is there really anything that I can do? But I said to myself, look, I'm only 25. I'm not going to, if I live to be, you know, the average life expectancy of 80, that's another 55 years. I'm not going to be a hypocrite for the next 55 years. I, I've got to change my life now so that I don't live a majority of my life as a hypocrisy and through this hypocrisy. So rather than feeling you know, overwhelmed, I actually felt inspired and empowered because these documentaries and these books that I was reading and watching they didn't just tell me the problems that existed in the world. I also learned that there were solutions. I learned that there was a different way of doing these things. So sure, I definitely had days of just, you know, whew, just feeling just overwhelmed and that deep pain in the chest about the state of the world and there were times where it was, you know, overwhelming to the point of not knowing if I could do something. But what I decided to do was embrace the situation that I was in. I decided that I could only be myself. I could only be in the place that I was in at the time. And I could only be the time that I was in. So I had to deal with me. I, I wasn't able to control other people. I wasn't able to control the corporations or the government but I was able to control myself. And so I decided that I was going to change my life one bit at a time. And this wasn't going to be selfless. This, this wasn't necessarily about sacrificing. This was about taking control of my life. This is, was about this was about being able to wake up and actually feel good about my life and my actions. And this was about ascending delusion, about starting to understand who I was and how my actions rippled out around the world. And so I decided that I was going to start changing my life one bit at a time. And I thought this, I came up with this, you know, idea that if I just made one positive change per week, that I'd be able to make over a hundred positive changes in two years. And so what created the, the what, what actually worked for me wasn't the thinking about it. That was important, the learning, but it was the setting out on the path and starting to make changes by putting myself into action, that is what allowed me to change my life by actually changing my life. And so tomorrow, that's what we're going to go into. We're going to talk about 
over a hundred positive changes that I made. I'm going to use those as examples of how you can make those as well. And some of them will be bigger, you know, and more extreme things that you won't be able to get to right away. But some of them will be very, some of them will be very easy changes that you can make immediately to start shifting your life. And what it was for me was that these individual changes, what they did is they created a foundation with each positive change that I made. I created a more solid foundation in being the change that I wanted to see, in being the me that I wanted to be. And so these these changes aren't just about the action themselves, but they're about creating an empowered human being who can stand up and who can stand strong in the face of these challenges, in the face of corruption of corporations and governments and such. So tomorrow, we're going to go through those uh, through 100 positive changes and more. And so for now, I'm going to use the next 20 minutes or so to go through questions. So I'm going to scroll through these questions. And so please, as you know, questions that you have right now, especially ones that are really related to this, the awakening is really the focus of this particular video. And I'm going to be doing a live video um, every day for this week, like I said. So I'd like to go primarily through questions of, you know, what we just discussed, but uh, do ask questions that you'd like. I see my mom. Hi, mom. Nice to see you on there. Smile back to you. And let's see. Okay. So I'm going to start looking through questions here. There's a lot of comments. And while I do this, I'm going to mention this again. If you are on this channel and you haven't subscribed, make sure that you subscribe so that you'll get notifications of the next videos. And then also, if you haven't already, next to the subscription, there's actually a little bell. If you click that and you click all, then you'll get notified when I put out a video or do a live video. And I don't do a lot of videos, so it's not like going to be crazy or anything. So let's see what questions are in. So uh, Alicia Serratos. Hey, Alicia. Nice to see you. So she said, we saw the list of your favorite documentaries. Is there a list of books too? So that is a perfect question uh, that goes along with this is the change. The change came because information already existed. I didn't have to come up with this information. There was already so much out there. So one of the earliest films that I watched was Food Inc. That was just mind-blowing, rethinking our food, realizing the reality behind my food and the destruction that it was causing and realizing that the food that I was consuming the planet through the food that I was consuming. Zeitgeist was another documentary. Um, Earthlings was another documentary early on. What the bleep do we know? Um, this was a this was a very eye opening documentary for me early on, and so if you go to robgreenfield.org/films, that is a a blog that was called Twenty Three Films That Changed My Life, and and then since then I've been adding films to that as well, and there's maybe forty or fifty different films on there. As far as books. Uh, Michael Pollan, The Omnivore's Dilemma, and Food Rules were some very mind-opening books for me. And if you go to robgreenfield.org slash books, that lists a a good couple of handfuls of the books that were really mind-opening to me. Mark Boyle's books, uh, his nickname is The Moneyless Man. He lived without money for three and a half years. He has been one of the more foundational human beings in my life. Through reading his through reading his books and through reading his work online. Let's see. So Celine says, "Hi Rob, I want to change my profession, but it scares me. I don't know where to start." So I have a blog that is called uh, "How to Quit a Job That Doesn't Serve You or the Earth." So if you go to my website. I think it's robgreenfield.org slash quit your job. And that is basically my guide on rethinking your job. For me at the time during my transformation, 
I did actually have a company. So my company at the time was called the Greenfield Group, and we did marketing. And so at the same time as I was awakening, I was also running a company and trying to make money. And as I started to change my life, I realized I had to change my company's life too, because my company really was just an extension of me. It's very easy to outsource things and say, well, that's not me. That's my job, or that's the company. Or, uh, But the reality is, is that I was the one running the company. That was an extension of me. As if I was an employee working for a corrupt company or a company causing destruction, that is that my work is me performing that work. So I decided that I had to transform my company. At first, I switched over to basic, well, basically one of the early things I did is I joined 1% for the planet and committed that my company would donate at least 1% of revenue to environmental nonprofits. But really, I think I committed to at least 10% of my environmental revenue being donated to, or sorry, my revenue being donated to environmental nonprofits. So that was one way that I shifted my company. And at first I was still selling advertising to companies that I didn't support, promoting buying junk and unhealthy food. And the more I, shifted my life, the more that I had to really shift the company. So I switched to eventually only marketing for companies that had a positive message. And through a long transition, I got to the point where I said, I will only market for a company if it's a company I would basically market for for free. As in, the, what they are doing is meaningful enough that I would tell people about it, not because they're a customer, but because the world needs to see more of it. And there were other changes in between, but that's what I did is I shifted my, my company from one that was environmentally destructive to one that could actually have a positive impact. And I moved away from printing my stuff on plastic to doing online marketing so that I wasn't creating, I was creating tens of thousands of pounds of garbage by putting uh, advertising on hotel key cards and also on grocery store carts. So radically transformed my business. And then eventually I just, I've moved largely away from money in the last nine years since I woke up. And then I eventually closed down my business in around 2014 or 2015 and started the nonprofit instead. And then about one year ago, I closed down my nonprofit. How I make money right now is public speaking, and I've committed to making less than the federal poverty threshold per year. The last three years, I've made $9,800, $8,000 the year before that, and $5,000 before that. So mostly I live extremely simply, so I need a lot less money. So that, you know, goes into a little bit of that awakening and that transition of my business as well. Let's see. Okay. Hi, Rob. Where can I find information about how things are really produced that I use daily, uh, like energy, water, food? Okay. So one of the most important resources in my awakening was a short film called The Story of Stuff. And this blew my mind. I realized there's a whole process to get all this cheap junk to me. And so this short film goes through the extraction of raw materials, the shipping, and then the processing of those raw materials, and then uh, how getting it to the store, and then us having to go and buy it, and then it breaking after a short period of time because of pers of planned obsolescence, things that are designed to break, designed for the dump, and then going to the landfill. So from extraction to landfill, this short film called The Story of Stuff really just opened my mind to the reality behind everything, whether it was a microphone or a computer or a they use the you know example of a cheap radio that's only $6. How the heck is a radio only $6? It's because costs are externalized. And that was a big part of my awakening as well, 
was realizing that things were very easy and convenient for me because the burden was being placed elsewhere. I kept coming back to, you know, 2011 at the time, up to 2020 now over the last decade. And I'd keep looking at my actions and seeing that I had it so easy that it was everything had been made so convenient. And I kept asking, well, why is this so easy? And why is this so convenient? And what I kept coming back to is that the burden had been placed elsewhere, that destruction was placed elsewhere for me to have that convenience and that comfortable way of life. So an easy example of that is driving a fossil fuel powered vehicle. So this is your ankle. You sit down in the car and you just go like this. Or this is your ankle, your foot, and then you go like that. And then all of a sudden you're going from zero to 60. Just move that foot forward and you're going from zero to 60 miles per hour or 100 kilometers per hour with no energy spent. So where is the burden being placed? Well, you have 10,000 oil spills that happen per year routinely. The burden is being placed on the other species, the other humans that live there. How about the oil refineries where those are located? Well, the oil refineries are located generally in near low income neighborhoods. And the people who live there have two to four times higher rates of cancer and respiratory diseases often. So the burden is being placed on these people who don't have clean air anymore, on who, who don't have clean water because of the pollution. And so this is what I learned. So the story of stuff is an amazing resource to, to, to watch. And they have a whole series of videos about bottled water and, and uh, our clothing and all of these. So I would highly recommend that as an early source for awakening. Uh, Boris says, for an environmentally friendly life, do you think living in a tiny house is a good option? Yes, it can be a great option. It's by no means the only way to do it. But it is uh, one way to really live simply, to decrease your, your need for large amounts of material possessions, having lots of bills, having lots of stuff. So I've lived in a tiny house twice in San Diego and in Orlando, Florida. And it's a beautiful way of existence. But there's other ways to do it as well. Let's see. A Fishes and Loaves says, hey, Rob, is the group that helped you learn about growing food in Florida in South Florida as well? There are a lot of ways to learn your, how to grow your own food. If you go to robgreenfield.org slash free seed project guide, that is my guide for beginners on how to grow their own food. And the reason it's robgreenfield.org slash free seed project guide is I designed it for the 10,000 people who have received free seeds from myself and Live Like Alley Foundation um, to help them start their own gardens. But that guide is helpful to everyone. And if you go to robgreenfield.org slash grow, if you are in Florida, that is my guide for Florida. And it has a lot of information both for Central Florida and down south for you as, as well. So the group that I worked with the most was called Orlando Permaculture and then also Sustainable Kashi and Sebastian, but there is a lot down in your area as well. And that, that website, robgreenfield.org slash grow has a lot of information. Let's see. Okay, Amal says, how can I live more sustainably while living in my apartment? Would love to grow my own food, but it just seems complicated in my situation. All right, so when I lived in my apartment in, so, you know, a lot of people look at me and they see that I've lived in the in this tiny house, this 50 square foot tiny house in uh, California, and then a 100 square foot tiny house in Florida. And also I often am living with almost nothing. Right now I have 44 possessions, all that fit into a backpack, which this is the backpack right here. Everything I own fits in here right now. And so a lot of people look at that and they think that it's always been this way, but you've seen that I went through a radical transformation. It wasn't always this way. So before this, I was living, when I was going through my awakening, 
I lived in a three bedroom apartment. And when I first moved in the apartment, I took the largest bedroom because I had a lot of stuff and I felt like more space was better. And slowly I went to the second biggest bedroom and then the smallest bedroom. And then I actually moved into the closet, which was 36 square feet, just six feet by six feet, just barely big enough for me to stretch out. And that was as I was downsizing my life. And all of this change was happening while I lived in a you know pretty typical apartment. So I started to make all these changes in my apartment, like, for example, getting rid of paper towels and napkins and using reusable cloth towels instead, and getting rid of all the stuff in the house that wasn't needed, and doing gray water, so collecting the water that came up from under my sink, and rather than it going down the pipe to sewer to be treated, instead collecting that to water my plants, to grow food. And so I actually luckily had a video, well, a a guy come over to to film it in 2012 and have produced a video. So if you go to my videos, you'll see one that is um, simple and sustainable living in my apartment. I released that in but 2016, finally, after filming it like three years before. So that video is a lot that you can do in a par- in an apartment. And if you go to robgreenfield.org slash house guide, that is my guide of changes that I made in my home that is that are things that are, you know, largely adaptable, whether you're living in a house or an apartment in the United States or around the world. Okay. Well, Boris says, how much money do you think it is needed to start a more envir- environmentally life with a tiny house, get water from the sky, forage for food, etc.? It can be anywhere from zero to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on how you do it. I built my tiny house for $1,500 and To turn a whole front yard into an abundant food garden cost about $500 or $600 and within a short period of time was producing that amount of money worth of food per month. Thousands of dollars worth of food per year easily from a $500 investment. So it just depends on how you do it. If you're highly resourceful, you can do it for next to no money. If you want to downsize luxuriously, I know people who have tiny houses that were 150,000 US dollars for a tiny house or even a quarter million dollars I've heard of. So there's different ways of doing it. Um, If you're interested in doing it the least expensive way, I would recommend my, my YouTube videos from my tiny house in Orlando. And I actually did a video on the build, teaching how to build one out of 99% secondhand and repurposed materials. So Joe Sinaro says that is not possible in Switzerland. And I'm not sure if you're talking about exactly what I'm talking about right now. But what you have to do is take examples and adapt them to where you are. So nothing is applicable to everybody in the world. The easy way to not create change in your life is to look at exactly what someone else is doing and say, I can't do that, so I'm going to do nothing. That is exactly how you can maintain your status quo without having to change your life and to be able to rationalize it. Now, the int- if you are wanting to change your life, then what you have to do is you have to think critically and problem solve and look at the scenario and figure out how you can take what works and adapt it into your situation. So it doesn't matter where you live in the world. There is a way to live in a more sustainable way that requires a lot less money and that contributes a lot less to destruction and where you can live the life that you want. Now, it's cha- it's more challenging for some people than others, but for most people or that are watching this video, where there is a will, there is a way. So it's really a matter of, of being of problem solving, critical thinking, and figuring out a way to do it where you are. Let's see. So Nicola says, 
Uh, hello, Rob. Do you think you can start a family while being a self-sustainable minimalist, or do you have to sacrifice some of your ide ideas temporarily to be able to provide a good life for your kids? So that's a great question, and that you know goes perfectly in alignment with my transformation. When I woke up, I was a single person, 25 years old. You know, lived a, a life that I could change it as desired. I didn't have kids or dependents, um, so my transformation you know, relatively easy compared to waking up and having a wife who hasn't woken or, you know, a, a spouse who hasn't woken up and kids who don't want to live that lifestyle. As an example, that would be a very difficult place to be. So personally, I actually chose not to have children so that I could live exactly the life that I wanted and so that I could live a life that was super dedicated to making the change that I wish that I think is needed in the world. So when I was 25 years old, around the time that I really started to wake up was when I got a vasectomy. And that was for many reasons. Um, one of them being that I had seen the destruction that birth control causes for so many people that I loved through depression and through throwing off their, uh, you know, their hormones but also, I was not supportive of the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry is one of the early things that I realized was a hugely corrupt industry that was largely controlling so many people. And so that was one of the reasons, but also because I wanted to dedicate my life to, to really focusing on the change. And so I write about that at robgreenfield.org slash vasectomy. But to the point of, can you do this with a family? I cannot personally prove it as myself because I've chosen to not have a family. However, there are thousands and thousands of families out there that are living with their actions in alignment with their beliefs and that are living sustainably with children. And there is a, I'm actually working on a resource guide right now that will share videos and families with blogs to really provide that. But one of my favorite YouTube channels is a channel called Exploring Alternatives. And they have multiple videos of families with children. And then another one is um, Happen Films. Those are two of my favorite YouTube channels. And both of them have some great examples. So yes, it absolutely can be done. It has been done as long as humanity has existed, and it is absolutely 100% possible. It's a different challenge, and actually, in time, my plan, one of the things that I'm going to do on this YouTube channel is visit families that are living sustainably to share more stories and more examples of that. The same goes for uh, cold climate. I've done my extreme sustainable living projects in warmer climates in Southern California and Florida, but it can be done in cold climates too. There's um, different designs. So you have straw bale houses, for example, that are amazing insulation. You have passive solar heating. There are different ways, and then there's earth ships as well. So wherever you are, there is a way to live more harmoniously with the earth and be working with the earth rather than fighting it. So it can be done into the family. It can be done in colder climates. And those the colder climates is something that I'll be demonstrating as well. Actually, I'm really, I haven't announced this over YouTube or social media yet, but I am going to do a year of growing and foraging 100% of my food in a cold climate. I'm committing to that. I'm going to do it. And so I will be demonstrating it most likely. Right now I'm thinking upstate New York. That's zone five or zone six if you know climate zones. And I will be doing it there. So I will be doing about two years of living sustainably in a cold climate as one of my next projects. But also... I'm also going to be visiting families and people that are living sustainably in cold climates and showing examples of that as well. So Tony says, you have no idea how happy you just made me, Rob. Why is that, Tony? <laughs> Do you live in New York? Amber Kelly says, I'm in Pennsylvania and I need help. 
Superb says, come to Massachusetts. All of you can come and visit me in New York. What, what I'm setting up in New York will be hopefully at a farm. I'm going to be part of a community, creating a bit of a community where you can come and you can stay for a day, a week, maybe a month and learn how to grow food, how to live sustainably. And that's actually one of my long-term plans is to set up a place where I will be spending a good portion of my life um, and where people can come and lear- learn to live simply and live sustainably. So we won't, you won't always just have to listen on YouTube. You'll be able to come. Black's Kid says, I live in Philly. So net zero, cool. So you can come out and visit. Um, Francis says, I'm not sure what that means. Dan Gurney says, your next project, will you allow yourself to eat with friends? I can eat with them. I just have to forage the food and eat with them. Or we can forage the food together. Terry says, Rob, have been watching you for a long time. Very interested to hear about your plans. Teach us, Obi-Wan. Peace, yo, you rock. Good to hear, my friend. Um, So that's going to be it for today. And I'm so happy that so many of you are on here. I've been watching the the count, and it's been nice to see that most of you who have joined have have actually stayed on here. It's beautiful to have spent uh, almost an hour with you all. So definitely, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure that you do. This video will be on the channel after it's live, so you can go back and watch it again if you haven't seen it. And if you haven't already, click the little bell to get notifications. But I'll be live at the same time for the next four days. That is 11.11 New York time. That's 8.11 a.m. California time. And that's 5.11 over here in France. And so. I love you all very, very much, and it was a true pleasure to spend this time with you. I guess I'll finish my tea. Oh, actually, for those of you who um, consider this the end of the talk, but I think um, if this interests you, why don't you go ahead and practice a little breathing? So a lot of people during these times are having a a hard time with, you know, the time that we're in, uh, being stuck at home with isolation and such. And so I just want to share one small practice to end this. And now that I think about this, I'm going to do this at the end of each video. And the practice today is just simple breathing. So I'm going to take 10 deep breaths. And I encourage you to join me for this as well. And the purpose of this is just to find centeredness, to balance, and to reduce stress and anxiety. And Boris says every hour. Yes, you could do this every hour, just spending two minutes every hour. So I'm just going to do five deep breaths. You're welcome to watch or you're welcome to do it along with me. And then I'll say goodbye for real.
that felt good. <sighs> really, really nice. So I encourage you to do that. And uh, yeah. All right, again, I love you all very much. I'm here with you in these times of difficulty. I'll be here with you for the next four days, but for every day, whether I'm online or not, I am here with you. And uh, I'm excited for everything that is that is to come. I think that we can use this time to change our lives for the better. And that's the purpose of this series. It's, it's not just to fill the time. It's not just to provide en entertainment and inspiration. This is about changing our lives. And that's what I'm here to do is to help you change your lives radically, transform your lives to live the lives that you want. So tomorrow, 100 positive changes that you can make to live more sustainably, more healthy, and more happy. I love you all so much, and I will see you soon.